Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Taylor Combouzier, a mining analyst at Red Cloud Securities. Today's webinar features BlackRock Silver. The company is focused on advancing its 100% controlled Tonopah West project in Tonopah, Nevada. Uh, in 2022, the company announced a maiden mineral resource estimate uh, for the project, delineating 42.6 million ounces of silver equivalent. Since then, the company has been busy drilling a property to expand the strike length of known veins uh, outside the resource area and expanding silver gold mineralization. The company has also tested its Tonopah North property that returned interesting lithium, lithium intercepts, which it's then subsequently optioned off to Tearlock Resources while retaining rights to the other metals uh, than lithium. Uh, that company is uh, prepping a mineral resource estimate uh, in the near term. Uh, and then in June, uh, BlackRock also announced that it commenced the 2200 meter drill program at its Silver Cloud assets. Today, I have with me on the webinar Andrew Pollard, who's the President and Chief Executive Officer at BlackRock. Andrew, good to have uh, you with us today. Yeah, thanks very much, Taylor. It's uh, good to be here on uh, what's looking like uh, one hell of a day in the markets, too, uh, with inflation numbers showing more cooling down south. Um, and, you know, it's a reminder as to why investors actually invest in stories like ours. Gold's up 1% today, silver's up 4%. And, you know, what you're seeing are the expectations for, um, I guess, that September rate hike that uh, took everyone by surprise a few months ago uh, has effectively gone off the table. I mean, it's looking like this might be the last one uh, at the next Fed meeting in a couple weeks here. And, this might be the beginning of the start of the next real bull run, not just in gold and silver, because gold, you know, is still pushing near its all time high right now. But for the equities, which have been absolutely decimated um, in terms of ounce in the ground valuations over the last year. So, you know, this is one hell of a time to be getting in front of investors talking about what we're doing. Um, and, uh, you know, if we can time that with a good market, then it's easy money. Um, so with that, uh, um, if you could bring up my presentation, I'm happy to get started here. Yeah, just uh, run through the disclosures on my side. Oh, sure. Yeah, we jump off. But that, uh, you know, provides a, a great outlook for today's webinar. Uh, the format of today's uh, uh, webinar, with that said, uh, will be a presentation uh, to give you an outlook on an upcoming catalyst for BlackRock. And then in the second part, we'll do a live uh, Q&A session. So please send in your questions uh, using the chat box at any time throughout the presentation. Um, so for the disclosures uh, for BlackRock, there may be some forward looking statements made on this call. I would direct listeners to the cautionary note on page two of the corporate presentation located on the company's website. And for Red Cloud Securities Inc, I would highlight that this webinar is for information purposes only and should not be considered a solicitation to purchase or sell securities or a recommendation to buy or sell securities. And we note that this call does not take into account the particular situation or needs of individual investors. Participants should rely on their own investigations and seek their own professional advice before investment. Please see our most recent research located on our website for BlackRock specific disclosures. So with that out of the way, I will now turn it over to Andrew to uh, go through the presentation. Awesome, thanks very much. There's absolutely gonna be some forward looking statements here. So buckle up um, and you know, we don't have to go too far into the future on this one um, because we've got uh, all of the catalysts effectively for BlackRock seem to be lining up for the second half of this year. And, you know, as Taylor mentioned, we've got three different projects to talk about, all three different stages of discovery, and we're tied to three different commodities. So um, it's just going to be a, a very exciting time that uh, we're in right now. Um, as I said, certainly some forward-looking statements, lots to look forward to. Uh, you know, we started drilling our Silver Club project just last month, so we'll have some assays pending. We already do have some assays pending in the very short term. We've announced um, that we're doing a resource update at our Tonopah project uh, some, some point before the end of the year. And then, of course, we've got a maiden mineral resource um, that we've been told to expect early, uh, either late this year or early next year from our joint venture partner on our lithium discovery. You know, it's been four years, really, since um, I stepped in at BlackRock. I'd, I'd actually been an investor in it for about five and a half years in total. Um, when I joined the company in May of 2019, it was, you know, barely on life support. In fact, if people had any compassion, they would have pulled the plug. In fact, many investors did. Um, in May of 2019, when we came in as a management group, you know, it wasn't a shell. There was a management team and, and they had the Silver Club project. But, 
Um, effectively, the ball had been dropped. And, um, you know, when I joined in May of 2019, three cents and a million dollar market cap. But we knew we had something. We knew we had a hell of a project there, even if we hadn't got a discovery yet. And I went about building a team. Within about six months, we went from three cents to 37 cents on tens of millions of shares traded. It was really, really easy. Uh, of course, we timed it with a good market too. Um, but then the unthinkable happened. Um, between, say, the end of 2019, early 2020, um, COVID started happening. The world shut down and we lost 82% of our market cap in the next four months. Every single piece of news you put out was a liquidity event. It just caused more selling. And then that selling caused more people to sell. Um, There's all these external factors. No one knew what was going to be happening with the world or what's going to happen with the economy. Um, you know, along the way, in I think February or March of 2019, uh, 2020, we thought we, we, we did something really good. We picked up what immediately became our flagship asset. We announced that at 20 cents. Um, three weeks later, we were seven cents and it looked like, you know, there was no end in sight. You know, I guess the only um, piece of relief there was, you know, there's this <laughs> can't really fall much, but much more to go but below zero. Anyways, along the way, um, you know, things started to turn around. We saw some glimpses and between March and July of 2020, we went from seven cents to a dollar 60 on the back of a new discovery, a proof of concept. That was one hell of a ride. In fact, that coincides with three years ago this week that we announced our first drill hole ever at Tonopah, which uh, was a 300, effectively a 300 gram meter intercept. And thus a brand new discovery was born, a proof of concept that a year later uh, got First Majestic to come in as a strategic investor, not once, but twice. Within a year, within two years of our first drill hole at Tonopah, uh, we put out a maiden mineral resource estimate on there, which not only established um, that the old timers that were mining this project 100 years ago left a heck of a lot behind, but it established the project at the time as the single highest grade undeveloped silver project in the industry. Um, since then, we're, we're still number one or number two uh, in terms of grade, and uh, we've stepped out. We've more than doubled that footprint of mineralization um, and we know that that opportunity is getting bigger. But the market got completely crushed, as you all know, not just us, along with everyone. There's not a single um, uh, advanced stage silver exploration or development company that has come out unscathed this year. Uh, we put out our resource at a time when high-grade ounces in the ground were being valued at $3 an ounce. Today, those same uh, ounces, but both ours and our peers or other high-grade peers, are trading at $1 an ounce. That just shows you the highly levered nature of this business. Um, it's been a wild year with the Fed, you know, raising rates at a, at a percentage basis that's never before seen in human history uh, or in recent history, uh, beats anything that they did under um, Volcker in the, in the 70s. And, you know, that's taken a lot of money off the sidelines and it's destroyed asset values. But it looks like inflation's cooling. It looks like the gas pedal, at least in the States, is going to slowly take the foot off that. And that means that stories like ours can run again. But man, new discoveries are a lot of fun. And guess what happened um, about six months ago is uh, on a three drill hole program, we took uh, what was our secondary asset, Silver Cloud, is the one that got me here originally as an investor five years ago. It's a hell of an opportunity, but we didn't have much of a mandate to drill it. Uh, because Tonopah, our flagship, is clearly the real deal. But we made a new discovery. We, we, we hit one really good drill hole, which we now think um, lines up with something that we can start showing some size potential and some grade potential. And as you can see, you know, there's nothing like new discoveries when they're time with a good market. So right now we're following up on a new discovery. It's Silver Cloud. It's high grade. It's the highest grade intercept we've ever hit as a company. But we're backstopped by our ounces in the ground at Tonopah. And we know those ounces are going to be getting bigger. We've got a resource update in the works. We don't have to do any more drilling to grow it. Um, so if we're tied to our ounces in the ground at Tonopah and we've got a new discovery that we're currently drilling right now uh, that's ultra, ultra high grade, then 
this is one hell of a risk reward um, proposition that we've got going here. And that's what we're going to be focusing on today. So, you know, we've got three different projects, as I said, all at three different stages of discovery. Tonopa, uh, which is literally in the heart and soul of the Walker Lane District, is where two of our projects are centered around. Um, you know, we're backstopped by some of the highest grade ounces in the ground in the industry. Uh, our resource update, which is coming down the pipe probably sometime in November, uh, is going to take into account about 25,000 meters of new uh, drilling we did since the last resource came out last year. And we've got a clear path to grow from there too. Um, our lithium discovery, now that's very interesting because in our search for gold and silver around Tonopah, we staked a whole lot of land around our private land holdings, uh, which make the form the basis for our silver gold resource. And it's on these new claims where we did some drilling last year uh, in search of just hitting some, some potential new discoveries uh, for gold and silver. Well, we didn't hit any gold or silver new discoveries, but we hit lithium in every single drill hole on these new claims that directly abut our property. Turns out that Tonopah, the district that we're in, is not just known as uh, one of the highest grade silver gold districts in North America, um, but it's turning into the Carlin trend of lithium right now because you've got some of the largest lithium deposits in North America uh, are directly adjacent to our project. In fact, uh, we're right next door, right on trend of and in the same rocks of a company who um, just put out a PEA on their lithium resource and it shows a $5 billion NPV. Um, and it looks like the drilling that we've done, we're hitting similar grades and is right at surface. So we've got a, a joint venture partner. It's a very heavy duty joint venture and um, it involves uh, a few of my favorite words, other people's money, uh, because they're spending it to advance that project toward a maiden resource estimate on the lithium side. So. Uh, we've got two resources to expect, uh, both on the silver gold and on the lithium, uh, coming down the pipeline very, very quickly. And we're following up on a new bonanza grade discovery in northern Nevada, uh, which we've got a drill turning right now. And we're following up on what was 105 gram meter gold intercept, not even including the silver uh, brand new discovery. So to talk about the, I guess, just the risk reward proposition, all of our valuation right now is tied to Tonopah. Um, you'll see uh, here, here it shows um, along the x-axis along the bottom, you'll see uh, us, Vizla and Dolly Varden are the three highest grade undeveloped projects in the industry right now. Um, we're trading all of us right around $1 an ounce. Uh, meaning even if we don't come up with anything at Silver Cloud, our valuation isn't going to fall much below that because high grade ounces trade at a nice little premium. Uh, also, what we do know is that our ounces are going to grow. We wouldn't be doing a resource update if it was going to be getting smaller. So we've got an opportunity to grow our valuation by adding ounces. So it's, it's the ultimate proposition here. Now, the other thing I mentioned earlier on was that, you know, we are highly levered. Um, we're levered to the price of silver. Now, Last time silver was $26 um, uh, for an extended period of time was in early 2022, uh, right as Russia invaded the Ukraine. Uh, it was at that time that silver, uh, silver developers like us, those same ounces would have been trading for 3x what they are right now. Um, obviously, the market's been pulled out and leverage works both ways. And here we are trading at one third. Uh, on an ounce of the ground basis that we were, you know, a little more than a year and a half ago. But that shows we're highly levered. We're a le levered call option on the price of silver and gold. So we might not, we don't even have to do anything to go on a ride should silver and gold truly go on a run here. But we actually are. We're adding ounces and we're following up on a new discovery. But, you know, this is one hell of a proposition we've laid out for the rest of the year uh, for investors. And, you know, given where we're at right now, I think, uh, I don't see us getting any cheaper. So I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about Silver Cloud today because this is one that I haven't really spoken much of over the last few years, given we didn't really have much to talk about. Silver Cloud is in the richest gold mining area in all of North America. In fact, we're 10 miles away from one of the largest um, gold mines in North America. In fact, uh, the Carlin Trend is now the largest gold mining complex in the world. Um, 
Now we're on a different trend up there. Uh, we're, we're right next door to it, but it's right where the Northern Nevada rift collides with the Carlin trend. So on one side to the Southeast east of us, you've got some of the largest gold mines in North America, but the Northern Nevada rift is an epithermal uh, gold belt. And it's known for some of the highest grade gold mines in the world when they're operating. We happen to be right next door to the Hollister mine, which um, in 2014, mining.com said was the second highest grade gold mine in operation that year. Uh, it produced at a head grade of 34 grams per ton. Um, you know, but what's what's more exciting to me is that we've got something. Our new discovery looks very Midas style in nature, and we're directly on trend of the Midas mine, which 20 years ago was the largest cash cow in the industry. Midas produced about 3 million ounces of gold at a head grade of uh, just under an ounce per ton, around 30 grams per ton. This was like the Fosterville of the mining industry 20 years ago. It's where Pierre Lassonde made his name. Uh, and it's uh, when, when Franco um, sold it to Newmont, uh, it was the Midas mine that kept Newmont profitable even when gold was 250 bucks. This is, uh, you know, what we're looking like is we might have the missing link between these two systems, Hollister and Midas, um, and what we're following up on right now has the chance to truly move the needle. This is an area of the world where there are no really juniors doing much of anything because it's all the big boys. In fact, Silver Cloud uh, is a major mining project. It's a project that both Tech and Placer Dome had at one point. In fact, it's the reason why we got the former head of Placer Dome Exploration, uh, uh, the head of their exploration, to join our company early on. His name is Bill Howell. He had a discovery here 20 years ago when Placer had the project. He, he drilled 12 meters of 5.5 grams per ton on a new discovery. Couldn't piece it together. They lost their budget. Uh, majors weren't doing much grassroots stuff at the time. And it's effectively been a time capsule ever since. When I got the keys to the company back in 2019, uh, I offered him the chance to get back in the driver's uh, the driver's seat. And what we've just done is we've pieced together that intercept he had 20 years ago with Placer with a 70 gram gold intercept and 600 gram silver intercept. And we finally know we pinned the tail on a donkey. We know which way things are running there now. This area is really, really perspective. Um, it's, it's in a part of the, uh, you know, even though it's known as the Carlin Trend or Northern Nevada Rift, it's actually known as the Ivanhoe Mining Distri District. Um, an upstart uh, mining entrepreneur in the 80s called Robert Friedland got a start there right next door at Hollister. He was mining a low-grade halo um, right, uh, right next door to us. Um, and, you know, what makes this district, the Ivanhoe District, very, very unique is the fact that the Ivanhoe District between, say, 1910 and 1960-70 was the largest mercury-producing district in the United States. Now, why is that important? Because mercury is the ultimate pathfinder element for these low sulfidation epithermal systems. Effectively, it shows you're on top of one massive hot spring system. The mercury bubbles up to surface along with silica. Uh, and generally what you'll find is that uh, in that same process with everything boiling up to surface, gold and silver gets dropped along the way in that boiling zone. But what it shows is that, you know, we're in, you know, this big mercury district, but Silver Cloud happened to produce half of all of the mercury in the Ivanhoe district. Silver Cloud's not named after silver, it's named after Quicksilver. And right in the center of her property is the Silver Cloud mercury mine. Uh, we've got what we think is one of the largest underexplored epithermal districts in all of Nevada, and we finally got a string to pull at here. So, you know, here's where we are in a satellite map. Now, what's interesting is in the in the lower portion, you'll see Gold Strike. That's Newmont's and, and Nevada uh, gold mines now, I guess. Uh, that's the biggest gold mine in North America. Um, but right next door to us is the Hollister mine. So Hollister, as I said, produced 400,000 ounces at 34 grams per ton head grade. Now, what's interesting about Hollister is the veins there go east-west. They actually were mined right up to our property border. Um, uh, but, you know, what's even more interesting is that the Midas mine, those veins are oriented north-northwest. 
We're literally the missing link. We've got 45 square kilometers in between these two high-grade systems, both of which point directly at our property. And the, uh, the discovery that we made, which we've connected with the original placer discovery and then the new intercept we had about 400 meters away from that, shows something very Midas-like. It's oriented in the exact same direction, same sort of vein width, and is hosted in the volcanics. Um, which is the reason why that the uh, Midas mine was about 10 times the size of the Hollister mine in, in, in terms of size. It's a nice, thick volcanic rock package. It, it's predisposed to holding lots and lots of gold, so uh, with, with some grain. So, you know, we've got the best of both worlds at our property. The eastern half of our project, uh, uh, at Hall, just like Hollister, uh, it, the Paleozoics are uplifted towards the surface. So you can sort of see on this gravity map here is that half our project is quite Hollister style um, uh, in, in terms of their rock package. And as I said, the Hollister vein systems came right up to our project. We've got an area called the Northeast Veins Target, which is directly adjacent to, tar to Hollister, which we haven't really tested at, any, at, at the correct depth, but we think there's a good chance to have the extension of what they were mining there. But it's the Northwest Canyon area here that's most interesting to us. That's the area which we're following up right now. It's, it's in a big, thick robin. So we've got a very, very thick volcanic rock package. Now we call it the silver cloud robin, but it might actually be the Midas trough or the Midas robin as well. But this area is predisposed to having the same sort of structural architecture. So a Midas, all of those 3 million ounces they produced were from veins that were a meter and a half to three meter thick. So we always knew the definition of success there uh, would be something that's about a meter and a half and 30 grams per ton head grade, uh, 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 gold grade. We hit that same meter and a half discovery hole here, but we hit double the, double the ounces or, or we hit 70 grams. We're on to something here. We now know which way things are running. We're gonna be trying to uh, show about 500 meters of strike potential on this drill program. We started it in, uh, on June 15th. Uh, we're probably a third of the way through the program. The drill's gonna be there through summer. Uh, we'll probably start having some results there um, uh, probably late August, early September, and more to follow soon after that. Um, but it's a fully funded program, uh, and there's not, many com there's not many companies in the industry following up on 70 gram discoveries, and certainly none in a good jurisdiction like this. So. Um, you know, what's also nice about the project is the fact that, you know, as we're literally the donut hole between Hecla, between the Midas and Hollister mines, that means that we're literally in the center of Hecla Mining's claim block up there because they now own Hollister and Midas. There's a mill uh, that's built in on care and maintenance at the Midas mine, 1,400 ton per day. That's within walking distance to our discovery here. hecla has got all the underground mining equipment we need. We wouldn't need to build a single thing if we can prove up a discovery here. Uh, and you better believe that they're watching this program right now because um, this would make their life very easy too. So this discovery is going to be one to watch. But what's most exciting about it is if, if all of the money, if, if the real excitement in the industry is based around new discoveries, well, those are pretty risky propositions. But if our entire valuation is based off Tonopah, then we get to have all that upside potential, but knowing we're backstopped and knowing that in fact, not even backstop, we're gonna be moving it forward. So with, with assays pending at Silver Cloud to look forward to in the next couple of months, let's talk about Tonopah now, because that's somewhat something that really makes us stand out in the industry. I told you within a year of our first drill hole there, we had first Majestic come in to us as a strategic investor. Um, within two years, we put out a resource estimate. But what's actually quite um, interesting is that right after we put our resource out, on the back of that, we were included in the Global Silver X Miners Index, which is the cell. It's reserved for the largest, most prestigious um, silver projects in the industry. We're the smallest entrant in, entrant in that index. We're among the likes of Hecla, Pan American Silver, uh, all the big boys. But the credibility we established on the back of this resource got us in there. Um, so we're clearly on the world stage when it comes there and people will be watching this upcoming resource we put out. Now the Tonopah Silver District is a district that's very, very famous. They teach it 
in a lot of geology schools and mining engineering schools. In fact, we have the Colorado School of Mines coming by our project every single year since we've had it because it's actually in some of their textbooks. Um, why is it so famous? Well, because uh, in about 30 good years, it produced 174 million ounces of silver and uh, just under 2 million ounces of gold. Um, but what's really most impressive about that was all of that production came from just seven and a half million tons of material. So what does that mean? It means it's ultra, ultra high grade gold and silver, but it also means the metallurgy there is phenomenal. Many of you that have been to Nevada, uh, you know, have driven on the side of the highway and, and seen, it says, welcome to Nevada, the silver state. Even though nowadays Nevada is known for, for its big gold endowment, the reason it's a state is because of the Comstock load and because of Tonopah. Um, they say that Nevada became a state because of, of Comstock and stayed a state because of Tonopah. It was the 19, it was the discovery of Tonopah in 1900 that reinvigorated the state. Tonopah was the center of the universe in, in Nevada for a long, long time. In fact, up until the 1930s, it had this, uh, the largest building in Nevada, uh, which was the Mizpah Hotel, all of five stories. Um, what we showed was the proof of concept on that first drill hole. And that was simple, that the old timers didn't stop mining because they ran out of ore. They stopped mining due to low metals prices uh, at the onset of the Great Depression. And, and that story is shown here on the bar chart. Tonopah was discovered in 1900. It was a hockey stick chart up uh, right up until around World War I. Things were going hunky-dory. Uh, lots of big-time mining companies set up shop. They started cannibalizing each other, growing, growing, consolidating the district. Um, but it was up until the 1923, silver was pegged at a dollar an ounce. Tonopah, uh, you know, not only helped revitalize Nevada, it also was um, crucial in revitalizing London after World War I. The silver from Tonopah um, was sold by the American government to the Bank of England. It was called the Peace Dollar. They used that to backstop their currency. So Tonopah uh, helped rebuild London after World War I and set their currency straight. Now, once they stopped um, pegging silver at a dollar an ounce in 1923, it absolutely tanked. It was the Great Depression. Um, silver dropped from a dollar an ounce down to about 25 cents an ounce by the early 1930s. And a lot of these big time mining companies had taken out so much debt to fund underground development um, that they couldn't pay it back. And because the stock markets were absolutely screwed, um, they a lot of them went belly up. We're the first group to come back in 90 years since production shut down and consolidate the district into a meaningful land package. And literally what, we're, we, what we've done is we've, we've, we've done that proof of concept that we've drilled something like 10 veins, uh, uh, kilometers and kilometers of strike. I think we're up to three kilometers of strike we've drilled out amongst those 10 veins now, starting from right where those old timers left off. Now the district looked in 19, this uh, map you see on the lower left hand side of your screen, that's what the district looked like in 1912. Um, every single one of those different colors represented a different publicly traded operating mining company. Now, if you cut that uh, map in half, we've got the entire western half of that or the bulk of the western half of that. And what really happened was a company called the Tonopah Extension Mining Company started gobbling up everything they could on the uh, northwestern half of that. And it's this company, the purple claim package you see here, that's really the missing link for the district. Um, it went into receivership in 1930 and it was picked up out of Chapter 11 and held by one family effectively ever since we got our hands on it. It's this purple claim package where effectively all of our resources and where all of the upside we see moving forward towards the Northwest. A few things I'll point to you um, uh, just on this map here, this yellow line that you see crossing across your property, that's US Highway 95. That's the highway that connects Vegas to Reno and Tonopah happens to be the exact halfway point between Vegas to Reno. Now, right, right next door to us here in Tonopah is the town of Tonopah, which is there because of the original silver gold discoveries. Now, Tonopah is an east-west trending vein corridor. The discovery early on was made on the east side from big outcropping veins. And what they did, the old timers in the early years is they immediately went underground. There's no drilling done in those days. 
They just drifted across if they lost a vein until they hit a new one. But all of that early production moved westward. So the western half of the district, which we now control, happens to be the where the last commercial producing mines were operating when things went belly up. It's where the last underground development was happening. In fact, the old timers at the Tonopah Extension Mining Company made a new discovery that they were preparing to mine but didn't get around to it because they hit Chapter 11. And it's uh, the blue sky portion, and we've proven that. So we're following things westward, but west represents blue sky. So Tonopah is interesting. Um, on the left-hand uh, uh, map, you'll see it happens to be sandwiched in between two calderas, so it's two volcano blow-off tops. The lower caldera you see to the south uh, is at a different age. It's much older. Uh, it's that caldera that's associated with a lot of the other bulk tonnage gold deposits, which the Walker Lane trend is known for. We're right, we happen to be right next door to a town called Goldfields, uh, and then one town over from us south of there is Beatty. Those are two heavy-duty, um, uh, big, big gold systems that seem to be associated with this lower caldera here. But it's this northern caldera here that's really, really interesting. And, and it's where, where that 100 to 1 silver gold ratio uh, that the Tonopah Silver Districts uh, is known for. And, and, and it, what we're finding through our drilling is that all of those silver gold veins, they start off east west down here, uh, in between here, just happens to be that's the way the caldera is running. But what we found is that as the caldera starts to wrap around, so too do the veins. So they start jutting up to the northwest. Um, we found that uh, luckily, very luckily for us, our land package actually runs out to the west, west here. Things start turning up towards the north very, very quickly, which is very fortunate for us. Uh, we're showing some significant uh, size potential um, uh, to the northwest here. But it's these two areas... Um, uh, that are shown on the under, underground historic workings here that are represent the two areas where the old timers were mining when things went belly up in, uh, on our land package in 1930s. The northeastern portion up here <coughs> is the Victor vein. It's the thickest vein in the district. They mined it down to 1,880 feet uh, where they hit water. Um, and they're big engineers at the Tonopah Extension Mining Company. They scoped out years and years of mine life at depth below that. So they took out some debt uh, to fund heavy duty water pumps and diesel generators. While they were waiting for those diesel generators to be shipped over from Europe and to be commissioned, they did what they did for exploration of the time was drift across underground. And it's here they set uh, uh, hit a series of new veins, which they called DPB, Denver Paymaster in Bermuda. They never got around to mining um, these veins. They were preparing to, but they never pulled out any more. So it's these two areas that we knew we had a really, really good shot at finding a lot of gold and silver. And it's these two areas uh, that form the basis for a maiden resource estimate. So those two areas that the old timers uh, left around 43 million ounces of silver equivalent um, at a block diluted grade of 446 grams per tonne. Um, we scope optimized this. We've constrained this more than any other resource that I've seen uh, for companies of our size in the silver industry in years. What this means is that uh, we did this for corporates uh, because we've already got strategic investment and we want everyone to be on a level playing field. This, when you scope optimize it, everything's constrained only to mineable shapes. We used a meter and a half cutoff for, for vein widths. So there's nothing below a meter and a half in here that made it in there that wasn't economic uh, using our cutoff grade. Um, but what this means is that all the gristle that a lot of junior mining companies put on their resources, uh, the gristle being presenting in undiluted numbers, for example, we factored in dilution to ours already. We probably cut the average grade down by 25 to 35% to factor in the block diluted grades. Uh, we based everything off actual mining costs of other American uh, underground um, scenarios. And, and, you know, we know which mining uh, method we're going to be using here. There's nothing exotic in here. There's no narrow vein mining like Rasu, which never really seems to work out for anyone. We used 80% uh, of the deposit as our QPs have um, stoked out here. 
uh, say will be will be mined using long hole stoping and 20% using cut and fill. Those are time uh, tried, tested, and true mining methods. The costs you'll find are very real here. But what you'll find here is that any time your average grade on a block diluted graces basis is more than double your cutoff grade, which you'll see it is, or cutoff grade for the for the deposit uh, between both Victor and DPBs 200, our block diluted grades 446. That means you're making money hand over fist. It's a very high margin operation. And what you'll see here, um, the, the green polygons represent those two areas I showed you on the historic um, uh, on the historic workings map. That's the two areas we backstop with the resource. Now, last year we drilled 25,000 meters. We stepped out a full 1.6 kilometers before our resource left off. And we've hit the extension of the same system on the other side of a fault. What we're showing here is that, you know, not only did the old timers not just leave that uh, meat on the bone of the areas they were mining, but we've showed the system keeps going. And as I said, right around that caldera margin, things start cutting up. Well, this structure that we're that was going to form the basis for a new resource, it's a north northwest structure. We got very lucky there, very very lucky. Um, but we're showing some size potential here. Uh, this is going to be the basis for the upcoming resource. And guess what? It's going to all link up here. We've got another kilometer of strike after this resource comes out to drill out to connect the two deposits. So not only do we know the resource is getting bigger, probably sometime in November. But it will lay out the path, the yellow brick road for the mother of all resource expansion um, programs after that to, to connect the two systems. And guess what? It's still open to the Northwest. Um, you know, another very important piece uh, that I didn't mention earlier is that our entire land package here, all of our resource here is on patented claims. It's on private land. That means that the permitting risk on this project is, uh, I won't say nil because nothing's nil, but it's a hell of a lot better in the sense that we don't have to deal with the federal government on anything. We could be underground in probably uh, 18 months or so once we file plans because it's only state and county level um, permitting required. So we think once we get this to, um, say, engineering study levels, we'll be trading at a way higher, um, I guess, ratio than most developers would be seen as simply because we'd be seen as a very near term producer if we wanted to. It was in our search for gold and silver on Tonopah that I told you we staked a whole bunch of BLM claims around us. And uh, it just so happens that uh, we hit lithium in every drill hole to the north. So in the north, this green uh, land package here, these are BLM claims. Um, we hit grades uh, that were very, very good in comparison to other projects down, in fact, right next door to us. And within about a matter of three or four months, we had multiple offers come in from lithium companies wanting to do deals on this. Um, we've got a heavy duty option earning agreement with a company called Tierlac Resources who have to spend $5 million US over just the next three years to earn in to 50%. And then if they want to earn into 70%, they have to spend another $10 million US after that. They're spending their own money and they've already done a drill program there where they've drilled out 7.2 square kilometers, 11 drill holes using core. Um, every single drill hole they did hit big blankets of lithium right at surface. Um, and they've been telling the market that they're gonna have a maiden resource estimate on the lithium side of things um, sometime by Q1 of next year. Now, this is the cherry on top. I mean, the real, you know, the if we're going to do a paint by numbers to growing our valuation, well, the most straight, straightforward path is adding ounces at Tonopah while we're on the silver gold while we're doing that. The next big way to add fuel to our share price is to make a new discovery at Silver Cloud and start showing size potential there. We're drilling right now. We've got assays pending. Now, I've been told that the lithium industry is doing pretty well these days. And, you know, it seems the only thing um, that's that, – the only thing that market's waiting for in relation to our project is to see uh, a resource update on there. We might have two new resources within the next six months, one establishing our lithium discovery, uh, one obviously showing more size potential at Tonopah, and then of course, um, uh, Silver Cloud, which uh, we're drilling right now and um, got a lot to look forward to. So as there is, you know, going back to it, you know, 
the, just the market alone, we're a highly levered option, a call option on the price of silver and gold right now. Um, you know, just to get back to where things were, ounces in the ground uh, just last year, uh, that's a 3x potential move we're looking at and other silver companies are looking at too. To outperform, add value, make new discoveries. And if we can get the lithium resource out there too, then I don't know any other company that's got more to look forward to over the short term than we do. Um, I know our downside's protected because we're not getting any smaller. Uh, we're financed for what we want to do. And um, if we make this new discovery at Silver Cloud and can walk it forward, I wouldn't be surprised if Hecla comes calling because they've got a very hungry mill within walking distance of us. And um, that's a very low barrier to get that moving forward. So with that, happy to hand it over to uh, Taylor for some questions and uh, we'll go from there. Perfect, great presentation, Andrew. So now we'll uh, turn to the Q&A session of the webinar. Just a reminder to everybody on the line that you can type your questions into the chat box. Um, so we have one question that's come in, uh, just wondering if there's any hints you can give on the, the Tonopah West Silver resource update, but I think you walked through the kind of parameters of the existing resource and where the, the potential is. I don't know if there's any other comments you can kind of make on that. Uh, yeah, so so to put it in perspective, the first ma the maiden resource we did, that incorporated about 100, 125,000 meters of drilling. Um, now, obviously, the hard yards, like the early discoveries, you've got to do a, a lot of new drilling to to sort of bring things online. Now, subsequent to that resource, we've done 25,000 meters of drilling. Um, most importantly is we've, we've more than doubled that footprint of mineralization. So this new resource is going to um, be focused uh, primarily on that Northwest step out that we hit 1.6 kilometers. We haven't drilled out that whole strike to, to, to infill that whole way back. So we know that upside is gonna be there, but it's gonna be really, really, really easy to infer once we get this new resource out, people will see three polygons all connected and a big distance in between them, which will lay the basis for um, the next resource update probably sometime in 2025. Um, you know, premature to give out, you know, actual targets uh, for, you know, what this resource will have. But, you know, and I don't want to take the fun away from that from investors either. But what I can tell you is we... we after putting out the last resource, we also went back internal to the DPB area and uh, filled in a few holes that, that maybe either the original drill holes might have missed uh, or maybe things are running a little differently. And we hit on some of those. And, and what's interesting about underground resources, it's a very, very high threshold. So either things make it and they're in or they're out completely. But if you've got something that didn't make it in because a drill hole didn't connect, you might see a lot of ounces come online from just filling in one little gap there uh, and tying things together. And that could bring a lot of tons online. So not only do we have this new discovery area, which is gonna be the bulk of the new tons, but I wouldn't be surprised to see a lot of tons come online within DPB area too, um, that we always thought were there, but we couldn't quite tie together or there was a gap. Now we think we've tied those together too. So um, this will be a material move forward and it won't have cost us a lot in terms of drilling to get there. So either way, we know Tonopa is getting bigger um, and then it'll lay the groundwork for a very, very straightforward drill program to connect uh, and fill everything in between that. And uh, so did those three kind of areas that you just mentioned, did that include kind of the, the southern end of the, the resource area? Yeah, we, we it, the, the southern end of the resource area was an area where um, a lot of the veins, you know, the, the northern veins, you know, the DPB area is a series of veins. There's there's Denver, Paymaster, Bermuda. We fit um, uh, two other new ones as well. Um, but it's the, the veins on the southern end, uh, end and um, towards the western side of it that we couldn't quite connect originally. So when that's the whole reason why we, we went back there uh, summer of last year to drill around there. And we, we did actually come up with some good intercepts. And more importantly, as we know which way things are running, we can link together some of the veins that we couldn't on the first resource. So a lot of tons are gonna come online in the Southern end of the resource and on the Western half there, just because we plugged a few holes. Um, and then of course the Northwest drilling too, which was the bulk of the drilling we did. Right, perfect, okay. Um, so we have a question here, uh, just wondering if you can go over the, the resource cost slide again. 
Sure. Uh, so, uh, uh, someone will need to bring up the. Uh, someone will need to bring up the the presentation. But effectively, what we did was these were the, the the way it was done. This is done the same way. You know, it wasn't based on arbitrary costs. It was based off of um, real world mining costs, which was scoped out um, as if we were doing a PEA using other peer companies in the U.S. Uh, at similar depths. Uh, looking at their underground mining costs using cut and fill and long hole stoping. Um, are you, is is the host able to bring up my presentation? So I don't have access to that. Um, yeah, just, yeah. But but it's based off of real world mining costs. So that's like we didn't come up with an arbitrary, you know, cutoff grade. It's this is based off of those. And then obviously um, that cutoff grade is also based off of the uh, the the gold and silver prices we use. Now the gold and silver prices we used at the time were seventeen fifty uh, gold and twenty dollars an ounce silver. Um, gold's been doing a heck of a lot better since we put that out, and silver's trading a hell of a lot better too. As the gold price and silver prices go up, that cutoff grade should go down as well. And when our cutoff grade goes down for our next resource, if it does, uh, depending on how things are trading at the time, then we'll see some ounces come online that way too, because things that might not have been economic at uh, at 1750 gold all of a sudden become economic at 1900 or 2000 so we'll see where things are there i don't know what parameters were used but it should certainly be higher um and yeah all the costs are laid out here so but as i was saying so if you use if you average out both um underground mining costs at dpb and victor you end up at 200 grams per ton cutoff using 1750 gold and and $20 silver um now as i said anytime your block diluted grade is twice the average grade that's that's a high margin low cost operation so um yeah you know these numbers aren't pulled out of thin air these are these are based off stope optimized block diluted everything fits within a mineable shape and we use realistic you know vein widths and and uh, for stopes as well so um there you go perfect um, we have another question here. Just wondering uh, how soon you can start drilling Tonopah again. Oh, there's no stopping. Uh, you know, Tonopah, we, we, we took our time um, uh, to model everything this year because, you know, we were the most, one of the most active silver exploration projects in the world. And it's not like we started with anything. We started with zero drill, one drill hole in the database on the Tonopah extension um, uh, um, claim, claim, claim block that we've got where all of our resources. So we went really, really, really quickly and we really wanted to make sure we got the updated model correct. So we've taken the time, we've paced ourselves. Of course, it's a market this year too, where no company doing any drillings benefited from it. I mean, there's not a single uh, silver explorer developer that's actually, uh, unless they're a new discovery, that's actually you know making any headways this year um, by, by, by drilling out their project. So, you know, the fact that we're able to move the ball forward uh, with a resource update here at the same time that valuations have been absolutely crushed has been good. In the last year, for example, in July of last year, we had 210 million shares fully diluted. Um, this year right now, we've got 230 million shares fully diluted. That's less than 10% dilution. Yet we've made a new discovery at Silver Cloud. The, we've made a new lithium discovery, which will have a resource on it soon and we're getting a new uh we've made the new discovery at tonopah and we'll have a new resource on there without having to spin ourselves out or raise a whole bunch of money when the market's not valuing ounces anyway so we might have timed this thing perfectly but when the market does come back and and should we you know surprise to the top and expectations and everything lines up perfectly we can do our next round of drilling at tonopah whenever we see fit and whenever ounces are valued and worth um uh diluting right now i still don't see the value proposition and we've got some you know a hell of a lot of nice catalysts to look forward to in the next three four five months here that we're sitting pretty and we're waiting for the fed to pause and hopefully cut because that's when the real money's going to be perfect um okay we question here just wondering uh what your current cash balance is and you know how far do you think that'll get you roughly? Yeah, so you know, our, we're effectively uh, we raised four and a half million dollars in March. We were sort of fortunate; uh, it didn't seem fortunate at the time, but uh, 
we, we, we were planning to start drilling silver cloud as soon as we could get up there. And it happened to be a really, really brutal winter in Nevada. It was the worst winter they had in 50 years. So we actually didn't have access to the project until early June. So what's nice about that is we didn't spend any money. I mean, our burn rate when we're not drilling is effectively it's 100 grand, 150 grand a month. Um, so we're fortunate to bide our time. And we've only just started spending money recently on drilling. Following the drill program, we'll be sitting on at least like a million and a half, two million bucks, which if we're not doing any drilling, that gets us for months and months and months if we want to. Um, you know, if we hit at Silver Cloud, I wouldn't be surprised if we get some potential strategics coming knocking on our door. Um, and certainly we've got the, the Tonopah resource to look forward to in Q3, early Q4. Um, so we're good through, through all of those unless someone makes us an offer we can't refuse. Excellent. Okay. Um, I don't see any other questions that have come in yet, but I'll uh, maybe give you a moment for the last for the last word. Uh, and then if anybody has any final questions, they can type them in now. We'll yeah, well, I mean, it's just, I, I don't think there's a better risk reward proposition in the industry right now. Uh, we're, we're, we're valuations entirely tied to Tonopah, but we get to ride a new high grade discovery, the single highest grade discovery we've ever made. And that says a lot because Tonopah is the second highest grade undeveloped project in the industry right now. So, um, you know, it's only going to get bigger. If we time this with a good market, that's when the highly levered aspect of what we're doing kicks back in. But until then, you know, we've been very conscious of our share capital. Uh, we're advancing three different projects on very little money spent this year. And, you know, I think if we show just a little more size potential at Tonopah this year and lay out that yellow brick road of, of that resource upside. I think, you know, you might see some, some strategics knocking on the door for that as well, because if you've been following what's going on in Mexico, the number one silver producing country in the world right now, that government's biting the hand that feeds them. Um, you know, there's a lot of companies right now with a lot of uncertainty in the silver business uh, that are in Mexico and they're looking to offset some jurisdictional risk. We're on private land in Nevada, right next door to a town. We've got the grade and we're showing size and we're advancing it pretty cheaply and easily here on in. Um, you know, I think we're one of the most compelling takeout targets in the industry. My only fear is that, you know, we, we, we don't rebound a hell of a lot first before uh, someone tries to do it. And, but a new discovery can change that. So anyways, it's a good time. I put 300 grand of my own money into the project, into the company in just the last in under a year. I'm a believer. I eat well, I'm a chef that eats his own cooking. Um, follow me or don't follow me, but I think the stars are finally lining up uh, and the Fed's laying off the gas pedal. So uh, it could be the perfect storm. Excellent. All right. So with that, I think we'll we'll wrap up. We don't have any other questions that have come in. Uh, so I would like to thank Andrew from BlackRock uh, for taking the time to host the webinar today with Red Cloud Securities. And thank you to everybody on the line for tuning in with us. Thank you all.